The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth webinar in this series, the fourth and last one. We got Organizing Your Teacher Tool Belt. As I like to do, I like to just talk at the beginning to make sure all the speakers and headphones and all that stuff is uh, set up correctly so you're not popping into a uh, webinar being like, is, is my, uh, my mic working or something if it's silent? Um, I will definitely not sing for anybody. I had requests and stuff. I hope there'd be no singing or, or poem reading or anything else, but I'll just give you a rundown of a couple of things that I like to do just to make sure uh, you can get what you need out of this webinar. Uh, one is if uh, you haven't done so already, if uh, you've already done it, I can hopefully uh, uh, help others that have not, but uh, stay with me here for a moment. If you have not uh, jumped into the handout section, uh, what I did was uh, I had uh, the certificate for this one, which is the Organizing Teacher Tool Belt. So make sure you grab that one as a Word document. And a couple people email me and ask me if, if there were other ones were available. I had the two other ones. I said I forgot to grab the first one out of the uh, the webinar software, and I can't for some reason. I just can't grab that first one. But I know we're going to share that. I know uh, Chris Lambert and his team will share that after this webinar. And once they get all the webinars together, uh, they'll have that one up on the website. And I know there is another uh, COVID nineteen webinar coming up on the uh, April sixteenth, I believe. Uh, so make sure you bookmark that and sign up for that one. Anyway. The handout section has the uh, certificate from this one and the two previous ones. So if you missed out on it, um, you know, definitely jump in there and grab those other ones. I said those will be available the entire webinar. And if you don't get it, uh, ACCSC, the team there will uh, grab my presentation. They'll grab the recording. They'll grab the handouts and they'll put them all up on the website soon. So hopefully, uh, you know, those will be up there for you to uh, check out and review if you need to. But in the meantime, definitely uh, check out that handout section. It's going to be on the uh, on your go to webinar control panel. I know it's different depending if you have a Mac or PC, or I know some people are on their smartphones and whatnot, but hopefully you can reach that handout. And if not, uh, stay tuned. Uh, you'll be able to grab that anytime. And um, I'll save a copy here on my computer right now. And that way I have the certificate as well. In case you need it, you can always reach out to me. So I'm going to click on the download button. And this one downloaded right to my downloads folder. I'm a, I'm a Mac person. So download my Mac folder. It's a docx folder or file. So that's a Microsoft Word file. And yep, loads up A-OK. -okay. So hopefully you can do the same thing. So I want to welcome you. Again, I'm uh, beaming out. Unfortunately, not beaming out at C-Tech down in New York, which we intended to do, uh, the original plan. Hopefully we can still do this uh, when, whenever I'm allowed to get out of my house and go down to C-Tech is, uh, is beam live. And we're hoping to do a live webinar down at C-Tech, one of the ACCSC member schools. And what we can do is we're hoping to do a live webinar on campus, and then we can stream it uh, through the ACCSC webinar here as well. Now, obviously, that can happen for obvious reasons. Uh, so I'm still up here in Northeast Ohio. It's kind of half. I said, I would like to say the weather because I always like I get jealous of everybody else. He's like, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida or or somewhere nice warm. It's not too bad. It's getting up in the 60s. We're going to dip down to the 40s, I think, next week. So we're back to being a little bit cold. But, um, you know, I said, if you want to check out the, the question and answer section, definitely put, uh, you know, where where you're beaming from. I'm again, I'm in my basement office, my makeshift office down here. Uh, in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I see a lot of people coming through at different places and um, hopefully you can uh, be A-OK. -okay. And Amy, thank you very much. All right, well, Massachusetts. My uh, my wife is uh, from uh, the Massachusetts area, so I try. she's a big Red Sox fan, as is my daughter, unfortunately, because I'm a, I'm a Cleveland person. So thank you, Amy, for joining me. Ginger, Nancy, Carol, thank you so much. I'm just going to go through my spiel one more time as we near the 15 after mark here. Uh, if you're just joining us, hopefully you can access those handouts. I have the certificate for today and the two previous ones as well, in case you missed it. So definitely grab the handouts. This is the fourth uh, webinar in our series. So if you missed the, the first one, two, or three, uh, you can definitely go on the website and grab that here soon. Uh, I know the team at ACCSC will share my PowerPoint presentation or my keynote presentation, which will be converted to a PDF. So anybody can uh, view it and download it. Uh, a lot of PDF viewers have slideshow mode, so you can actually show this if you need to and, and duplicate the experience that you're experiencing today. Uh, in addition, uh, you can get the recording uh, and you can get the certificate of attendance uh, on the ACCSC website. I'll save it right now. I just saved it a moment ago, so I'll be able to share it with anybody who wants to reach out to me, but definitely reach out in your handout section. Other than that, I see some other people jumping on, so I'm going to wait just a minute or two. I see it populating here, so I know sometimes, uh, you know, whether it's a Zoom or GoToMeeting or any other type of software, it's running a little bit slower than normal just because of the uh, volume of people on it, so I'll hold off for a little bit. That's why we started 15 after instead of the top of the hour. Usually, it's a little bit muddier at the top of the hour. Hey, Brenda from Columbus. All right, I give Brenda an OH. Uh, 
hopefully, yep, no problem, Ryan, with the handouts. I have Michelle, Monica, and Jennifer. I appreciate you guys from California. All right. Thank you, Monica. See, I'm jealous of Monica. I have a couple of friends who moved out to California from Ohio State University, and they got some jobs out in California. Uh, one in Monrovia is a good one. So we try to meet up every once in a while. Holly, thank you very much. I can't see you, Holly. I think we have our webcams turned off, or I don't have webcams on, uh, but I can see you in the question and answer. Jocelyn from Atlanta. I like, I think Lima's looking good. And Jim from Florida, Los Angeles, Texas. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to give this one more minute as the people join it in. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I said I'm uh, here in uh, Northeast Ohio. I'm somewhere between, if you drew a line between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, I'm somewhere in that no man's land uh, out, out in, the, in the beautiful countryside, which, which I really enjoy. Although I do miss walking just down to the nearest coffee shop too. But I want to thank everybody. Again, the question and answer thing is open. So you can definitely ask me some questions or put in comments in there. Uh, so I got Scott from West Virginia, uh, not too far away. I'm up in the northern panhandle, actually. So if I drive about 30 minutes, I'll be in the northern panhandle, Scott. Um, and, and everybody else, Kylie, Ginger, thank you so much. So with that said, I'm going to start beginning here in a moment. So if you're just jumping on, again, check those handouts, get those certificates. I know that's going to be super important. I want to make sure you guys can save those, uh, put your names on those, and you know file those away appropriately. And again, if you save it, you know definitely save a, a blank copy if you have one in case one of your teammates needs one or a fellow employee who couldn't uh, make it or can't download it, they can have a copy too. So always just save a blank one, and then when you put your name on it, just resave it with like your name in the file name, and that way you always have a clean copy available. And hopefully that will be helpful for anybody who couldn't get on. And then, yep, uh, Hiron said, yep, you should, get a, you should get an email. No, no, not everybody gets the email. Sometimes it goes to the junk folder. Sometimes I don't know why it doesn't go through. Um, and you should get an email and a follow-up with some information on it. But if not, j just uh, make sure you know you got the handouts. You got the ACCSC website, which will be updated soon. And you can always reach out to me, and I'll give it to you in case you need one uh, you know, uh, soon thereafter this webinar. So I want to welcome everybody to the fourth webinar, Organizing Your Teacher Tool Belt. And what we're going to talk about today is some strategies to – plan our, some of our lessons, engage our students, and then assess our students as well. So hopefully we can uh, get through uh, some good topics and, and pick up one or two nuggets of information uh, that we can implement in our own classrooms or in our own labs. I know we're all, we all come from different size classrooms, from uh, different types of backgrounds and fields, but hopefully you can pick out something. So when I talk about things, I may mention it in a classroom, I may mention it in a lab, but take what I say and kind of just put it in your own realm, and hopefully you can pick up some uh, one or two things there. So when I uh, when I think about you know organizing our, our teacher tool belt today, I always think about this one, and I, I might have mentioned this before in some of my other ones, but I just like it so much because it's one that sticks with me and makes me think about you know what I should be doing when I'm not teaching. So you know think about you know the quote where it says, "When fishermen cannot go to sea, they repair nets." Fishermen cannot go to see the repair nets. You know, this is this is so true across all of our all of our fields and all of our disciplines, whether we are in a classroom or a lab setting, or maybe we're in both. You know, when you are not in the moment teaching and training students, reflect upon and take action upon improving that teaching and training experience. And again, that's what my hope is today, is for you to discover at least one thing that can help you improve your net or add to your teaching strategy, add to your teacher tool belt as you help students become successful at your school and hopefully ultimately in their career. So what I'd like to do today is give four kind of um, steps and share this overview. And this is like an overall, I consider this an overall standard template to follow regarding teaching a lesson. If, uh, if you are a brand new uh, instructor coming to, to Grimes University, uh, I, would, I would advise you to follow this simple plan because this is a great place to start or a great place to reevaluate a lesson uh, that we may have and that we may think about changing for whatever reason. And it starts off with direct instruction, you know, and then it goes to offering some indirect instruction, moving to some interactive opportunities for students, and then finally offering some individual or independent instruction for students to train and learn. And when you follow this path, you'll note two things when this happens. One, you, as the instructor, move from high levels of involvement to lower levels of involvement. And two, in opposite form, you have students who move from low levels of involvement to high levels of involvement. So it's, it's a converse relationship where we are the center of attention at the, at the start, and we kind of just 
you know, give that up and put the spotlight on the students more and more as we move through this uh, four-step process. And with that, again, if I think about, okay, how can my lesson go? How can my lesson go just in, you know, today for this 40-minute period, for this two-hour period, or my lesson for this, you know, four- or five-day period? We can really implement the, this four-step process. So as we begin the process, I'd like to take a step back just a second and mention some items that we can do before we actually start step number one. And what I think about this is whether we are in a classroom on ground or in person, or we're in a virtual or online classroom, you know, thinking about what students are doing and what their opinions are and, you know, what they feel before they get to our classroom is such an important factor in starting off in this positive and this encouraging note when we teach. So if possible, make contact with your students prior to the start of the course. So not on day one, not as they walk in the door, which is perfect, but prior to the start of your course. For some students, making connections with you, the instructor, and even your fellow staff members, your, your fellow faculty members, this can really make a big difference in success or failure. We mentioned a couple times in other webinars of how important our rapport is with the students. It's the single most important thing. Teachers are the single most important thing in the classroom. So I want you to think about a negative first impression you had on a person before. Uh, I'm thinking of one, all right. So oftentimes, you know, and I'm thinking about a, a particular incident, and oftentimes this initial thought, this initial reaction is, is tough to overcome or even can take a while. I mean, how many times has there been where it really took a while to have someone like won you over because you just started off with maybe it was unjust or just you just had this feeling of, of this person and uh, you had this negative first impression, but you know it took a while and it changed, and you're like, man, I wish I wouldn't have wasted that that day, that week, that year, you know, with with this this negative first impression. So think about how powerful a negative first impression of your class can be to a student, and also think how powerful a positive initial impression can be uh, of your class for students. So online or even on ground, we found out a welcome email or a welcome video can be a great way to introduce yourself open up the lines of communications, and, and build that rapport with the student. So the message can include a you know, friendly welcome, offer words of encouragement, and then maybe you know, offer some tips to start off right on the right foot. You've been through your class uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of times, probably. You know where the hiccups are going to be. You know where the roadblocks are going to be. And you can offer that friendly advice to the student before they get through your door. And remember, let's not limit this to only you, the, the classroom or lab teacher. Uh, you know, if you're a staff member, you're an administrator, uh, you're part of that student support system, you can also make contact. You know, individuals at the school like, um, you know, a school advisor, I always like to refer to the career management director, they can always drop a message to say hello, store, extend the warm welcome. And, you know, what a great way for individuals who are, say, the career development department or the career individual, they're usually reserved at the end of a student's time at the school. Now they can be involved at one more time at the very beginning. If you're like a academic dean or you're the campus president, it's like the principal's office, right? You, sometimes it's, it's a scary thing to go to your office, but if you're a friendly face right off the bat, right off when the student starts a course, then it's a great way to do it. Now, I know depending on enrollment size, it can be um, you know, beneficial for uh, deans or campus presidents or someone in the administration field can offer that, um, offer that welcome greeting. And you know, if it's a lot of people, you can't sit there and make, you know, uh, 200 uh, enroll, uh, you know, individualized video emails, or even 50 or 25 individual uh, emails. So I know some uh, academic deans, some campus presidents, they'll just make a, a generalized, you know, you know, welcome April start students, and you know, give their uh, a few words, just like they would just in a an orientation. But just it's a more you know personalized feeling when it comes to them in an email, or it, there's a, a video that is shown either on your your social media channels, or again, it's straight through you know, an announcement if you're online or it's an email if you're sending it out to your on-ground students. So, and then I, just to share it too, because I always, I always like to go, I always like to mention the above and beyond people who, who have come across. I've had schools actually send like a welcome postcard to online students. So they had this postcard that they had this, uh, uh, you know, they created their own, you know, uh, personalized postcard of different students at school, graduation, having fun and stuff and send that out to individuals before they start. I had student, uh, uh, faculty on an on-ground campus. They, they had goodie bags with cute sayings like, um, 
oh, like you're a star and they gave him a starburst or, you know, much and many thanks was something like that. And what those M&Ms, much and many. Uh, unpopped bag of popcorn, a career management director brought by and, you know, she said, oh, just popping by and then, you know, just something fun and, and something, you know, personable and, you know, everybody likes these little gifts, you know, we get those sometimes we go to conferences, there's little things are just so nice to have and it's just a nice way to say thanks and welcome and makes students feel a little bit better when you can offer those things to them, whether again, whether before school or if you're again, career management director, do it the first day or as they come in the door, you see them in the hallway. Um, you know, give them some, give them some love at the very beginning before they start school, right as they start your school or start class. So anyway, the, the pre-class welcome in whatever way you think is best is a great way to extend and reach beyond the digital classroom or beyond your classroom walls and make this great first impression as they go into your lecture, into this direct instruction uh, type environment. So I just want to mention that right off the bat, just to share that with the, before the classroom. Hopefully you can use this online and some offline tips. And especially a lot of us who are jumping online right now, you know, our students and ourselves, we're used to the on ground, these in-person environments. So it's, it's going to be a big adjustment and we're losing some of that quality face time, seeing everybody in the hallways. Uh, it can feel lonely. And so just having those emails come through and it's nice to see uh, individuals that way. So <laughs> just to show, because I thought I, I have done these before uh, at the school that I taught online at, it was a mandatory thing where we had to reach out in a welcome email. So I would just, you know, I'd make it fun. I'd make an animated video of myself, welcome them to the class and give them, a, give them some classroom stuff. So that's, that's animated me on the left-hand side. I made that through a uh, Paltoon, uh, that's which they offer a free account. You just have that little uh, logo on the very bottom, right? But I don't care, my students don't care. So I made the little, you know, Paltoon animation video. They have templates, so it's not too difficult. If you're kind of tech savvy, you can be okay. And so I have that one. And of course, I said, you know, I'm from Northeast Ohio, so I'm a, I'm a Cleveland Indians fan. So if it was happening, you know, if I were starting classes uh, in April, I would definitely be done in my uh, Cleveland Indians jersey and given an, an opening day welcome. You know, and I, I have students who are in the in the Pittsburgh area, so I have a lot of Pirates fans. So it's a nice way to build up the rapport, uh, friendly rival and uh, get jokes back from students saying, you know, the Indians aren't going to be over 500 and stuff like that. So. You know, whatever you think can be a nice way to engage students. And the, the one thing I want you to notice, especially on the one on the right, is that, you know, it's not me in a suit and tie, you know, uh, trying to get in a nice background. We've had the best responses from students to teachers who are just themselves. They're wearing their normal day's outfit and they have the cat in the background. And students are like, is that your cat? What's your cat's name? You know, uh, I have a cat just like that. Or I had teachers that, um, you know, just introducing their family. This is my five-year-old daughter. And, and then uh, students will reply back, I have a five-year-old daughter too. You know, does she like uh, this cartoon and stuff? And it just builds that rapport again. And they see you as like a, a normal person. You know, I don't know if you remember if uh, I always thought it was weird when I saw my teachers, you know, in the, at the grocery store or something. I, just, I don't know what I thought when I was growing up, but like teachers were like just teachers. They weren't like real people. So trying to get over that hump. And, and making sure that we offer that report to students is going to be really important. And again, just make videos. You don't have to make it super nice. Uh, teachers can make, um, you know, a, a video in uh, with their smartphone. Some of the smartphones do great jobs. Your webcam that's built into your, um, your laptop, it can be just as good. Or some people have those USB webcams. You can record that uh, easily. So what you can do is, and it's, I had a couple questions come in. Uh, we have a uh, now, how can you make these videos? And there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, one is you can attach a very short video into an email. I've had um, instructors not make a video, but they're they're very they're tech savvy. They can make those little animated gifs, and they make like a waving uh, gif or something. They can do something real simple as that and type it out. Uh, what I do is I create it right on YouTube because you can create a, a video and upload it to YouTube. Then I always have it saved. And so I can, uh, if I have to reuse it, if it's reusable, I reuse it. If, um, but I can share a link to it. And then so that way students can go in and see that right away. Uh, if I'm on an LMS, learning management system, if I put it on YouTube or Vimeo, I can also embed it right into my learning management system. So on my course page, for example, I can embed my welcome video right on it, and then I can send an email that has the, the text version of what I was going to say, but also my email version. Because I know a lot of people might not want to watch the video or they can't watch the video for whatever reason. They might 
be at work and at a quick lunch break or or their kid might be sleeping in the background and they're trying to do their coursework. So I always try to write it out for them so they can see it and scroll through on their phone or they can uh, watch my video through a YouTube link, a Vimeo link, or just a very short e uh, attachment that you can put onto an email. Don't record like a five minute introduction video and attach to email because usually emails will cut you off at about 20 some megabytes. So it has to be a, a smaller type of video, not a 4K full resolution video. You're gonna run into some trouble that way. So I just, for me, I just use YouTube and you can send it as a private link. So, you know, I don't show up in search results. Uh, all my welcome messages don't show up in, short, in, in search results. It's only accessible through that link that I share with my students. And so that's just one way I do it. So I appreciate all those questions coming. That's a great way to do it. I said, it, you, if you know somebody who's tech savvy, go down the hole and ask that person. Because that's what I had to do for some of these things. Like, how'd you do this? Or how'd you do that? And some people use different software and I had some people use those animated GIFs and they can create animated GIFs on their smartphone app. And so they just have one waving at the students. I mean, there's all kinds of cool things that you can do that's just better than a plain old message. Again, a plain old email is going to be better than nothing. And then if you want to up the ante a little bit, try those uh, videos and animated GIFs or, or something, you know. Uh, uh, I have one too. I'll tell you an easy one that I've done before when I can't do a video for whatever reason. I do, uh, if you search the internet for uh, internet high five, you just get a, an outline of somebody's hand and I attach that. I said, I just want to give everybody a high five, you know, appreciate you coming to my class, right? So I'm a little more elo eloquent than that, but I attach that. So I give all my students a, a, a virtual high five. So you can look for an internet high five in the Google and you'll probably get a whole bunch of search results of the same type of image. So check that out. It's kind of neat. I just thought of, it might be neat to try and just show you a couple examples of that welcome message before we jump into it. All right. So thank you. Very, again, thank you very much for all those questions. It's good. Good point to raise in case you, you haven't done video yet. Uh, try it out. And again, just you might have to try it out one or two things and you'll find a rhythm. Some, it took me a couple of ways to do it. And I go, OK, I like this way. This way was the easiest way to do it. This one was the most efficient way for me to do it. All right. So let's go uh, into the blueprint here of our different types of instruction. So, again, we're going to jump back to this four step method here. And I want you to keep in mind as I talk about it that this is a kind of bendable, malleable type of four step process. It's not set in stone. You don't have to do all four uh, to be awesome at teaching. You can do one, two, three, four, all four if you want to. And you might use more one than the uh, other. It's going to depend on your students. It's going to depend on the field that you're in. It's going to depend on the class that you have at that time too. So as I'm given this, I'm just given a general overview. And again, think about, okay, how can I take this into my own class? I just want to just preface at the very beginning that this is not a, you know, do this. It's not black or white. It's not do this or don't do this. So I'm going to offer a couple things. Hopefully you can see these in your own courses. So first up is direct instruction. Now, direct instruction is teacher directed. And, and if you probably heard Sage on the stage, that, that moniker before. And although it sometimes gets a bad rap, uh, direct instruction, I think, is, is vital to imparting new information to students. Now, if it's relied upon too uh, heavily, or it's the only method for students, then yeah, I can see some, there would be some issues going on where students might not be too happy and learning might not be taking place in the most efficient manner. But, you know, when it's packaged and it's, it's, uh, it's complementing other types of instruction, you know, direct instruction can be a great way to review daily or previous items that you have. It can be great to present new materials that you're going to do today. It might be really nice to, you know, offer some clarity in sharing the proper way to do things, whether it's a method or a procedure that you need to showcase in a lab. And you're the expert. And so, you know, direct instruction is saying, you know, I have, I'm the sage. I know how to do this. I'm going to show you how to do it. And we'll go from there. So again, direct instruction, I think, is very important, you know, and, and really it, it's important because it lays the, you know, the layout basically of how we can meet those objectives. And so if you have objectives in your courses, which are hopefully you have objectives in your syllabi somewhere, uh, whether it's the whole course objectives or weekly objectives, you know, this is the foundation to getting towards those objectives. And hopefully, you know, you can sculpt your, your direct instruction into a way that offers clarity and, and, and greatness in a way where students go, aha, and get interested, and then they can start doing it themselves. So this, that's the direct instruction method. And so when you think about things for direct instruction, 
I'll mention a couple tools, and if you know tools that you have used that are more direct instruction tools, throw them in the uh, in the Q and A. I said we use the Q and A as kind of like a, a, a semi chat feature here. Uh, but for the tools that I see uh, prevalent in a lot of schools that I have visited and ones that I have uh, taught at before, uh, the one that I like in is, is examples. And I'm going to start real easy because examples is I'm not there's nothing fancy, right? Examples. Everybody knows what examples are, but again, think back and think about you know do you use examples an awful lot, or can I use examples even more? Because during a lecture, uh, you know. Providing examples paints this really nice real-world situation that's, I think, often better understood than a textbook uh, keyword or a definition or some kind of complicated description that students are trying to read on page 87. If I can provide a real-world example, and if I can provide more than one, then that light bulb is going to go off for that student a little bit better. So I always think about my direct instruction. I think, okay, what kind of examples can I provide to make this a, a real type of scenario that's easily understood. Again, it, they might read it in a textbook and it might be, you know, a quote unquote textbook speak. It might not make sense, but provide an example will be that aha moment you can give for the students. And it really just brings this level of understanding to certain topics that may be difficult for students to grasp. So try this example method and think about it. Maybe you do give one or two, but as you go through direct instruction, like for tomorrow, if you're teaching a lecture type class, think about, can I give any examples that maybe I didn't have in mind? And maybe you can implement those. And hopefully you see those students uh, light up and go, oh, hi, I really get it. So those are examples. I also like to mention drill and practice here as well, uh, because I think this one gets a bad rap as well, but I think it's super important as well. You know, this is definitely the practice makes perfect uh, scenario with students where repetition is, is definitely enhanced. And I think this is a nice addition to a lecture where students use repetition to maybe hone in on a particular skill. A typical example is probably like the worksheet that you can be doing. It can be creating uh, flashcards and going over flashcards. If you're, especially if you're in type of some type of anatomy type class, we have to learn a bunch of keywords. This drill and practice of learning the, these note cards and doing whatever note card strategy you want. You know, learn ten, put it off to the side. Then tomorrow, learn ten more, but re relearn the first ten and put those aside. The next day, you know, go so on, so on, and keep refreshing those note cards. That's a good way to do this drill and practice type of opportunity. So you want to reserve that for like the basic type of learning. It, it just, that helps out. And that's why it's in this directed instruction. You know, keep it when students need to learn, they need this, this, this repetition, and they need to really get the foundational knowledge down. And that's where the drill and practice come into play. Next one I really like uh, because it can be used either in person uh, or on ground or it can be used on online classes. And you've probably heard of the flipped classroom before. So this is just a, a slimmed down version of the flipped classroom. It's called flipped instruction. Now flipped instruction is the opportunity for students to you know, read or watch a recorded lecture that you've created. And again, we can think back, you know, if I can record something on YouTube or Vimeo or something on my computer, then upload it. I, you, know, you can do something like that. And again, use your webcam. Use your smartphone. It's, there's a lot, of, a lot of great tools at your disposal, hopefully, that allow you to create this flipped instruction, this recorded lecture. And the great thing about this is that now students can pause, they can rewind, even speed up your lecture, put you on double speed like uh, some people do on podcasts. And if they know the material, they just put you on double speed. If they need to relearn something, they'll just rewind it or scrub back a little bit and, and you know, replay that little section. You can also reply or just put up audio versions. So you can just record audio like we're doing right now. You know, just uh, if I took away the screen and just be an audio, we can do like an audio type of podcast, an audio lecture, so students can grab uh, the thing. So you can do this if you want to. So you can definitely screen share and, and maybe do a, a narration, say in PowerPoint, and save that narration over PowerPoint and save that. You can talk into the webcam. I have uh, teachers who talk to empty classrooms or they just sit at their desk and, and talk to. Some like to get up and stand up or have a standing desk and that gets them more motivated to teach. Or it can be sitting down and reading off a PowerPoint and showing the PowerPoint slides. Or even less than that, you can go and just record audio. And again, the nice thing about this is offering that opportunity for students to listen or watch or read, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, transcribe some of that stuff, you can do all those things outside of the normal lecture hours. So the great thing is, is that you can record a lecture, for example, and you can give it live, and then you can offer that recording later on. So students can watch it tonight if they need to, 
and get some information. Like, I, I remember what Mr. Grimes said earlier, but he wasn't quite getting it. Well, they can watch my lecture, um, you know, that's maybe uploaded online or shared somewhere if you have the opportunity to share it in a Google Drive or maybe your uh, school does have a learning management system. You can use learning management system to share those videos. And so it's a very nice way to do it. And again, it can be as complicated as me sharing my, my video and then sharing my screen on my YouTube, or it can just be audio. And sometimes audio is really nice because uh, students can listen to that in a car. They can listen to that to, on their smartphone, and they might be doing some chores around the house, and they can just pop on a lecture and listen to a lecture that way. So think about opportunities to record a lecture because it's a great way to have you basically become your own teaching assistant and help the students outside of your normal designated uh, lecture hours. So that's flipped instruction. Now, next on the list is charting, and I, I mentioned this just to reflect upon, you know, I think sometimes we may, and, and you know, not maybe, probably not you, but you know someone who uh, relies too much on PowerPoint, you get like the PowerPoint from like the publisher, you don't really change it up too much, and the publisher PowerPoint, although it's very great and has a lot of great information, it's just super text heavy, and it has 85 slides, and you know, is that the best way to present that information? You know, could a better way be, again, whether you're in a classroom or a lab, you know, is it just talking to the students? Is that the best way? Is it just showing PowerPoint? Is that the best way? Or can you, you know, have some type of chart or illustration, a graph or a table? Can that be a great way to describe it? And that way you're writing things down live. And sometimes that, uh, that, that activity of writing and seeing the instructor write things down. And again, think about it, you know, on the board. Or if you're in a lab setting, we all gather around one lab table or a lab area, and I can have a big like poster board size type of paper or you know those big sticky type um, uh, tablet things that you can put up on walls that you might see at conferences. You know, use some of those things and, and write some things out. And it's a great way to uh, share some type of charting or some type of illustration, some type of graphic that's different than a PowerPoint presentation that may be more passive than it should be. So even though this is direct instruction, can we do it outside of the PowerPoint realm? And just think about, maybe can we do some type of charting in some way? And again, if, if you've been to a conference, you might have seen those big sticky notes. I have a big tablet uh, in my office because every once in a while, it's just nice to put these up in, in different parts of, of the classroom or I can put this on a lab table and then I can sketch out some things that we need to do or a procedure that we need to do or uh, a part that, you know, I can sketch all that stuff out. And the for the student, they see me sketching it out. And it's a little bit better to stick to them besides being a slide full of text or a slide that only has one photo on it or something. And sometimes it's just a different way to do it. So just to keep that in mind, is PowerPoint the best way? Is straight talking to my students around a lab table the best way? Can I offer any type of opportunity so students can visually see some things? Uh, in addition to hearing things, so again, we want to hit all the sense, all the different senses if we can. You know, if I can see it, hear it, you know, touch it, that's going to be a, a lot better than just you know hearing someone do a a lecture. Last but not least on there is the uh, demonstrations, and I think these are key. You can you know tack on a demonstration with a lecture, or maybe you can lecture through a demonstration. Again, seeing you perform a procedure or go through steps visually, and then I can hear it on top of it. That's going to help students understand the concepts better. So again, moving away from just, you know, the, the death of PowerPoint, for example. Every day, it's always a PowerPoint for lecture. Can we chart? Can we do a demo instead? Can I lecture through a demo? You know, can I do some uh, uh, more engaging things and offer more of the lecture type stuff at home? And they can watch the videos at home or before class or after class. Can I do drill an example? Uh, you know, those are some things that we can also do. So with that said, I just want to finalize things. If anybody said any, anything about um, the questions here, they say they use chunking to break down something else, and then back to chunking. So that's perfect. So that is a great way to do direct instruction instead of, say, a 45-minute lecture. Do, uh, uh, you know, 10 minutes and 10 minutes and, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or five minutes and break it up a little bit. And that way you chunk it down. And that way it's not the same thing over and you're not talking for you know, 45 minutes straight, it's these breakups of different things if you're in there. Um, I have someone else that says they, um, real world examples lead to student engagement and discussion. Perfect. So that's awesome. Thank you, Charles. And then uh, Holly, yeah, um, it just depends. If you're speaking about the flip instruction, that can be either, either one. So you probably wrote, I think you wrote this when I was talking about it. So I apologize if, uh, if I already mentioned it. But, uh, you know, when you do the flip instruction, that is up to you and what you think your students might like. 
and it can just be audio. It can just be uh, me as a talking head type deal. It can be me uh, standing in front of the classroom teaching, or it can just be my, my PowerPoint presentation. I've seen instructors do all, all of them. And, and uh, I think to, uh, the students appreciate just having the opportunity to review something if they need it. And for the teacher, it's great because I can always refer back to that, that lecture, refer back to that one if it's saved, especially if I have a student who misses for some reason and they give me an excuse, they can watch my lecture. I, sh I, give, I share that link out to that student and they can listen to it or watch it. Uh, so that's a, a nice way to do it. And for my students who struggle a little bit in my class, you know, who, who don't work great uh, live for whatever reason, uh, maybe they need some confidence and they'll watch my lectures beforehand or they'll watch it afterwards. And so you can, you can do that. So I thought that was a, a good idea. And it, it's just been nice to have that extra thing. So um, you have a sign up sheet and offer extra for any student who uh, after a lecture finds and shows a five minute or less video that goes along with the lecture. Perfect. So it's that extension of that lecture. So it's making that connection. So I like that one. Perfect. So how can you get these students engaged with lecture? Thank you so much. That's awesome. So again, that's types of uh, instruction that's going to be direct instruction. So as we move down a little bit, again, we're going to take the focus away from us, the sage on the stage, and start shining the spotlight a little bit more on the students. So, you know, once we provide that new knowledge, we do that lecture, that foundational knowledge, we can move towards, you know, the student thinking a little bit more and begin to make some connections with this new material that we presented with them. And, you know, we can present it maybe with some different opportunities, just like the, uh, uh, Jeanette was talking about on there about maybe doing some extra extensions to that type of direct instruction. And so, you know, it's beginning to look a more student focus. It's not fully student focus yet, but it's beginning to look more student focus. Uh, students aren't as passive. And what you're doing is, you know, you're still there directing traffic, so to speak, and you're guiding the activity. You're still guiding things with them. You're an active participant in their learning still. Um, and, you know, in addition to getting the students to maybe think about these new concepts you introduce, you maybe you want them to do some guided practice as well. So, again, the big thing here is you're going to be still the guide. They call it the guide on the side. So you're there in this guide, this active guided um, uh, role in the classroom or in the lab. Now, whereas, you know, before I think you were in the I do method type of instruction, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm doing. Now we're going to move to a we do method when we look at direct instruction. And this is where students can have, you know, more hands-on, a little bit more active. Uh, but again, it's still guided by you. It's directed by you. That's why they call it indirect. Some of these tools that we talk about for indirect is something called aided demonstration. And I think aided demonstration is really nice because this can be you know, having a student or two demonstrate steps instead of just me up there and, say, and, de and demonstrating it. Sometimes the aha moment comes for students to seeing other students doing it. And it really helps the two or you know one student who's up there demonstrating because they're learning it uh, right on the spot. So they're going to have this memorable moment of them doing that, that demonstration. So if you can have students demonstrate it in front of everybody, that's going to be great. Aided demonstration could be where you are going through and everybody is at a station, let's say in the lab, and you're going through the steps and everybody's following you step by step. And so you can go through and learn those steps as well. So that's a nice way to go through and and do it whether it's just one or two students or maybe it's everybody you're you're doing you're aiding a demonstration that's done by everybody in the classroom and again look at this it's a little bit more hands-on for the students but again you're still the guide and so i like aided demonstration visualization i always like to mention too visualization is great because it's a way to um, get around not using the equipment all the time and so when you think of visualization, you're walking through students through a procedure. You're walking through uh, the different methods of taking vital signs in a patient for a medical assistant or a nurse or whatever it might be. And uh, again, there's certain things you have to do. And if you walk through them, and whether their eyes are open or closed, you just have them visualize that process. And you do it with them first. And so you're guiding them through this visualization process. The awesome thing about this one is now they can do it on their own at home or after class. And it goes back to, and there's like a famous basketball free throw study that goes over this that says, you know, there was a group of, of uh, players that visualized shooting free throws and, and going through uh, the methods of setting up and getting everything set and, and doing a follow through and making free throws. And there's ones who actually went to a court and practice in real, you know, real time. 
And the ones that visualize did just as good, if not better, than the ones uh, that actually practice. So visualization is a great way uh, that may not be done just because, you know, you just haven't thought about it in that aspect yet. So I do offer you the chance to try that out, hopefully, and it, and it might work. And, and again, I don't, you don't need all the dental equipment. You don't need the medical equipment. You don't need scissors or, or cooking tools or anything else. It's just you're just visualizing uh, that procedure in a student's mind with you being the guide first. Now, going back and kind of tying into some other things, I've had teachers that recorded this guided thing. So uh, I, th I think of it almost like as a guided meditation, but you're guiding them through the cooking process, through the vital sign process I mentioned earlier. And so the students always have your voice as that guide. So maybe they're at home, they can play that, that guide, that procedure. First do this, then do this, then do this, and do that. And they can follow that and visualize that you know, back, back home with their headphones on. So visualization is a great way, I think, to implement some, some lab activity where there is no lab present. The third item on the list is case studies. And this case study is, uh, is kind of like a building block from the examples that we talked about in direct instruction. You know, now you can present a real world story that highlights a concept that you just taught. And the nice thing about this one is students will have to think critically a little bit. So you get that little uh, check mark there and you can uh, they have to analyze the story of your case study. They have to gather important facts. They have to you know, understand the context of the scenario and deduce what the correct answer may be, even though there might be several uh, different uh, correct answers. And so just note that, you know, when you think of a really good case study, there might not be, and hopefully there is not one correct answer. Maybe there was the uh, method that someone did or you did in a scenario, and that's always the best case they always uh, to, to share is the ones that you've been involved with in the field. And so if you can share your own stories and say, this is what I did, or this is what my team did, then you can say, well, you know, and this is the, what happened. That's not the right way. Let's hear what everybody else had to say. And some people and some groups and some individuals will come up with some great scenarios that, you know, that could have worked. And it just gets them thinking about all those concepts you just talked about and try to implement that in a case study. Um, now, what you want to do is when you do a case study is, is start with that core question first. You know, what is that core question you're going to ask uh, the students? For example, for us, you know, if we were going to do a case study, I would maybe ask you, you know, what do you do with a difficult student who dominates the conversation in class and thinks she's a know-it-all, for example? So after I find that core question, which has a variety of answers, by the way, uh, you know, I can start painting that backstory up and offer that as a case study that we can maybe all do if we were all sitting down in the, you know, in the buzz at C-Tech, for example, we can all figure out and then we can divide up in the groups a little bit and we can have these case studies where, you know, students would have to think in a group or think individually of what they would do in that situation or what you would do in that situation. And we can all share our different answers. And again, there's not one type of uh, answer, but I'll share what I did with my student that, who happened to be a difficult student and was appearing to be a know-it-all. And so I share that with them. And so again, case study is really nice because it brings in these real world experiences that they're looking forward to, you know, in the career field back into the classroom. So I know students always enjoy you know, looking at the career field and thinking at it and thinking of real world examples. It's going to help them uh, be more engaged and help them, you know, be, uh, you know, be better, hopefully, once they get out in the field, because they would have all these different case studies that they may, you know, have to deal with themselves one day. So I love case studies. And then the, the next one on the list here is the fourth one down. This is metacognitive prompts. And to me, it's just a fancy word of saying, you know, let's get students thinking about their thinking. You know, this helps students know, you know, what they know, what they don't know, or maybe what they need to know more about following a lecture. You know, oftentimes you may have to prompt them. So this is why this is indirect, because if you just said, I want you to think about your thinking a little bit, you know, students will be puzzled. They might not know what to do. So sometimes you just have to give them a little, little nudge. You might ask them, you know, I need you to think about or write down or share, you know, a word or words that you did not know very well. And these are blank. Maybe you can share a prompt that says, you know, I want you to tell me when you felt most confused about what was what was most confusing at this point right here. And you could ask that type of, of prompt. And if you're doing a lab, for example, or a demonstration or you're working with students in the lab, you can always ask them, you know, like, how do you think this works? And again, that makes them think a little bit. How does this thing work? And hopefully they can reiterate that back to you. You could ask them, you know, how did you how did you determine this to be so and so? Again, just 
get them thinking about what they're doing. So they're not just doing it. They're thinking about what they're doing. They're thinking like, okay, I do know, I do know how this operates, or maybe I don't know how this operates. I, I got, I got it out of some luck here, but I just really don't know how this works. And this gets them to thinking about that, that type of a- aspect on it. You could also ask them, you know, do you agree or disagree and ask them why? So this is the way it's supposed to be, or this is the way it's done. Uh, do you agree with that? And then they'll, they have to, again, they have to think a little bit critically and give the reason why. So metacognitive prompts is a good way to help you um, get a better understanding of the students, whether they're, what they're thinking, if they're getting things or they're struggling, but it also helps the students see that same aspect. And again, that critical thinking is a soft skill that we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, put into our students as they go through all our different courses. So, you know, think about metacognitive prompts and, and you might find yourself, uh, hopefully finding these very useful as you kind of go through and get the feel of how students are doing in your lab or in your classroom. And the last one I just want to mention here is group work. If you're you know, on ground or if you are online, it's mostly discussion boards. This falls into direct instruction because you can start off, I would say, easier or um, a little bit, I think, more in control with this uh, indirect instruction with uh, group work. Sometimes it takes a little bit to ramp up to giving uh, total autonomy to, autonomy to your students to go at it. And so, you know, whether it's group work or discussion boards, make sure you're an active participant in this group work. For discussion boards, for example, uh, I know students uh, who uh, appreciate a teacher who posts first. Or there has been uh, rules for teachers that go and say, you have to reply to every single student in your class. So I would go in and reply to, usually I had 25 students in my class. I would go and reply to 25 students throughout the week, just making sure everybody uh, felt that they, you know, had some uh, input by me as the instructor. And so just, you know, that engagement, that, that kind of guide to them on the discussion board or that guide to them in group work is going to be very important, especially at the beginning when they're trying to sort out and, and work in teams. So I just want to mention group work, even though it's more of a interactive activity, it can start in indirect instruction. You can have a lot of control over it, let them work in groups for a little bit, but really be that guide for them in group work and discussion. So with indirect instruction, Again, if you, if you know some indirect ones, throw them in, into the chat. I'll try to finish. I'll try to knock them out uh, here or later on as we wrap up everything. But uh, when we're talking about indirect instruction, it, I think it's a nice complement to direct instruction. You know, you begin taking the focus off of passive learning and you begin giving opportunities to use critical thinking skills that we mentioned. Uh, maybe they're guided reflections we talked about in some of those prompts. Maybe it's offering discussions. Uh, and problem solving in those case studies. So it's, again, it's taking the training wheels off a little bit. It offers some more thinking by the students. It's less passive and more thinking. That's when you think about indirect. How can I get the students to think a little bit more? And so for anybody, I got some, uh, I got some great uh, tips here. I'll just share some of our same ones. It says our campus has made up index cards with case studies and the students have to act them out. <laughs> so they say like, so for a MA lab, given the reason uh, the patient is coming in, do vitals, and the doctor orders tests, and students do the tests. That's perfect. That's actually one I'm going to share here in a little bit uh, with some interactive ones because uh, that one, you'll see that, you know, some of these things can fall in either or category. It just depends on how much, again, how much a guide you want to be and how much or guide you don't want to be. And that can go from direct to indirect. And it'll go from direct to interactive, which we'll talk about here. So I love that. Uh, very good. Uh, follow-up questions to get students to dig deeper. Yeah, definitely ask questions, this one. Uh, don't ask the, you know, uh, the question you don't want to ask students is like, does everybody get it? Because if, if, uh, if you're like me, my students will look at me with the dazed and confused look, or they'll halfway nod, and I assume everybody's okay, but usually there's going to be a handful of people who could use some clarification. So I just call on people. I go, you know, I would say, Nazar, do you think this, this, and this? Or I would say, you know, uh, uh, Caesar, what do you think about this? And then so I'm going to put that person kind of on the spot and, and see if we get it. And that way it will promote this discussion. So don't, yeah, don't uh, just say everybody get it off of these follow-up questions to get the students to dig deeper. And again, I like to ask them why and, and go uh, more and more. Perfect. So thank you so much. I'm going to, I see a couple more coming, but I'll, I'm going to go through and knock them out here and just get to interactive instruction. So this, I think this is our bread and butter. I, I really like interactive instruction because this is where we get students fully active into learning. And what we can do is, again, we're taking off the training wheels fully now. We're saying, all right, we're giving that push 
and we're seeing how the students can do when they're working by themselves. Now, there is this involvement that still goes on, and it's this teacher-student relationship. And you're actively involved in the students, uh, but you're, you're there as an as-needed uh, per, uh, person. So you're not there as the guide anymore. You're there in case they, they raise their hand or they say, hey, I need some help on this. Then you become active. And the same thing with students and student interactions. Now they're working in groups. They can rely on each other to figure some things out as well. If they are working maybe individually only in pairs, they can have the opportunity to ask you or ask uh, peers to help out in this interactive instruction. And so going on uh, with, uh, with the comment that was made in the chat, which is, which is perfect uh, uh, kind of uh, example in this one is this, this role playing one. And I had an instructor that did the cards too. And it was almost like charades kind of, and it was a, a medical assistant. And they would have these um, role playing. Again, this mimics what they would do on the on the job. Instead of just talking about it or reading about it in a book, they would role play a scenario out. So they would take vitals, for example, was mentioned in the chat. And the card would say, you know, and I would I would come by and and, and play around too because I just, just like being involved in the students. So I would I would come by the classroom as an academic dean, and you know I would get a card. And one of the cards was like I had to be like an angry patient, <laughs> you know. And so how does the student respond? You know, maybe they could take vitals, and that's perfect. But you know, taking vitals in a real world situation, uh, I just know being at the doctor's myself that it's never the quiet, perfect environment in, in the doctor's office. You're going to have a patient who's going to be angry. Uh, we had cards that said, you know, you're a patient that talks through uh, g g getting your blood pressure or your, your heart rate or whatever it is, you know. And so I'm just talking and I'm and that, that student has to react to my card. Uh, you get cards that say, you know, you are a overly involved uh, family member. You know, you can be maybe another a fellow nurse, a fellow medical assistant in there to help out or or whatnot. And so you have this role playing going on. And again, this mimics the real life experience and, and students really love that, that role playing um, idea. So I appreciate that share in the chat. And this is exactly what I was thinking about in role playing. The one for role playing I think about is more interactive because you can start more indirect. You can give guided cards out and really be involved and stop them and talk about, you know, what they should have done, what they should have done and so on. Or what you find out is if you do role playing all the way through your courses or all the way through the course, by the end, students will try to implement their own thing. And so they're, they're trying to be a certain person. They're acting out their own things. They don't need these cards anymore because they're trying to figure out a way to stump the other person. It's kind of a fun thing to do if, if you have the right class. So, you know, it can be indirect and it can be interactive. Role-playing can fit in any, any one. I put it here in interactive. The next one I want to mention, this has just happened recently. So I, I, this was an extension off of something I was thinking about. And then uh, these past weeks here was uh, discussion rooms. So we have a lot of schools moving online and they wanted to do synchronous video, for example. So they have these live chats, so these uh, uh, live lectures going on. Uh, but we had schools that want to offer discussion boards where students can uh, you know, answer questions. Uh, the teachers can put up a prompt for that week and, or like a help message board or so on. So discussion was really great. And then we had a couple uh, schools go through and, uh, uh, and want something called breakout rooms, which was fantastic. And this is such a great idea because it mimics a, a great type of um, interactive instruction on the ground or in person where, you know, you have you work in smaller groups and you might come back together in a larger group. Now, whether your learning management system uh, offers this or maybe your conferencing software offers this, it's a way for you as a teacher to, say, do a live lecture. And I can have a couple people break out of my students. They could break out in two, three, four, five people break out into a smaller, like a conference room, a smaller kind of like Zoom meeting. Uh, and then this other group maybe goes into this other small group meeting and they have to work on a project. They have to put together, um, you know, some type of plan. They have to put together some type of presentation and they have 15 minutes, they have 45 minutes, whatever it might be. And then we all come back into the main conference room and then we all you know, share our screen or we talk about things of what we found out in our breakout rooms. And if you think about this on ground, this is a way to, you know, I put the students, you know, go in the back of the classroom, the student goes into, you know, these students go in the front of the classroom, or maybe the student goes to an empty classroom across the hallway. It's that same concept just done uh, virtually online. I was, I'm just so impressed that uh, the, the schools that are adapting to the online environment so quickly too. So I just wanted to share that one out here. If you happen to do breakout rooms, uh, definitely use it because as a teacher, you can just jump around. Whether it's different tabs or different windows on your screen, you can jump to the small breakout rooms and jump back into your, your main breakout room as well. So that was a, that was a pretty cool 
aspect there. So I uh, appreciate that share uh, with uh, breakout rooms when I was looking around to get some, uh, some ideas. So that's breakout rooms. And the same thing with real-time chats is, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're in the conferencing software, you do have that, um, that live chat feed, whether it's in a breakout room or a main room. Uh, some people use live chats as a um, kind of office hours type thing. So at 6 p.m. tonight, you can come to my office hours and we can chat live if you need to. So hopefully that works out A-OK. -okay. And then the last thing I want to mention on here are two things, actually. One is tools that allow you to mimic things that you would do on ground and collaborate on ground. So for uh, these tools, I have a couple that I share that I've, I've used or uh, people have shared with me. And one is obviously Google Docs because Google Docs is great because you can be in the same presentation at the same time and edit it. If you're students, you can be in the same Word document. Uh, you can be in the same uh, Excel spreadsheet or the Google Sheets, and you can edit those in a way too. So those are good ways to do it if you're a Google type person. You can use Google, uh, the Google Drive to share files and so on. The next one is Twidla, and it's T-W-I-D-D-L-A. And Twidla is a nice way to um, have a free uh, interactive whiteboard that you can share with everybody. So if you just want to collaborate uh, live and you can annotate and draw. Uh, Twidla offers you and your students a way to off, uh, you know, to share a screen basically and annotate whatever you want to annotate on it. So Twidla is a very nice uh, type of tool. And one that uh, that was shared with me too was Video Ant. When I talked to somebody who wanted to um, offer a way to annotate videos, and so Video Ant is video annotation. It's a free software. What you do is you put in a say a YouTube link into Video Ant. And then it gives you an interface where you can make annotations. As a teacher, you can create annotations first, or you can share that link and then students and yourself are annotating the video uh, back and forth. So it's a cool way to uh, get uh, some you know, comments and stuff that are right next to the video. And that video will have these little lines that show where those annotations are. So it's a nice way to be a little bit more interactive instead of like bringing a discussion back into a discussion board and say, okay, I need you to, you know, watch this video and post your discussion here. That discussion takes place right next to the video. So as students watch it live, they can also see those annotations pop up off to the side. So there's so many cool uh, collaboration tools. Uh, you know, if, you, if we type in collaboration tools into, into Google, you're going to find like, you know, those websites say the top 30 best collaboration tools, especially now, as a lot of uh, companies are offering um, you know, a, a free trial or offered a kind of a free version on some of these things. So you can search those out, but definitely look at those tools to offer that, you know, real live online way to interact with each other, whether it's through documents or a whiteboard or through video. So it's a nice way to do it. And last but not least for interactive instruction, uh, I like this one is students teaching students. Uh, this way is great because the best way the student can hopefully learn and, get, and feel the pressure uh, that he or she needs to learn something is that they need to uh, be an expert on it and tell you know their fellow classmates all about it. And this one is nice because it's not this like private grade exchange between me and the student. You know, I the student hands in their paper, only I see it and I grade it, or they do a test and only I see the grade. Now they have to present in front of everybody. And again, this is a great soft skill builder as well for that public speaking or uh, that teamwork type deals. Uh, and, you know, students really have to learn the material and they will because they don't want to go up and, and not know what they're talking about. So students teaching students is a great way to do it, whether you're in a lab setting where a student will teach the other students a, a, a procedure, this part of the procedure, while the other students will teach this other one. Or maybe it's, you know, this week it's going to be Monica's turn to display something and uh, the other week it's going to be uh, Ginger's turn to display something and so on. Uh, you can, you know, have ways to have students be the teachers and teach different lessons. And this is always a nice way, again, to put a little added, like, oomph and, and pressure even to uh, the, the students trying to uh, learn something and then teach it. So that's a, those are some interactive ones. I didn't know if anybody else had any interactive ones. Again, throw them in the chat if you do have cool ways that you do interactive instruction. Uh, so as you're, as you're looking at those types of, um, you know, uh, interactive activities, whether the ones that you see on the screen kind of spot off a different one, or maybe you saw one that you really liked, you want to try out, just know there's a huge range of different things to implement in your classroom. You know, 
And even though it's uh, interactive and student focused, uh, note that you're planning to outline clear objectives, uh, to outline clear instructions, to set the appropriate amount of uh, engagement and interactive time, and even instituting efficient group sizes and, and, and how you're going to share it. Those are all going to be keys to the success. You can't just say, okay, I want everybody to do this, go at it. It takes some careful planning on the front end to get it going fairly well and have the students have this positive experience. And remember, this is a great way to capture those soft skills that we mentioned a little bit today, but also uh, especially in previous ACCSC webinars. So take account uh, these soft skills as you assess these attributes and these type of interactive activities. Like, don't discount teamwork and what teamwork means maybe in, in your field and put that into a rubric or put that into the assessments that you're going to be building as you create these interactive instructions. All right. Anybody else? I, I, I know. It, it, someone uh, said the biggest issue is the students who never log in to email them, create announcements, demonstrate that stuff. Yeah, there's going to be individuals that, uh, that are just kind of like on ground. No matter what I do or whatever you do, they're not going to be engaged. They're not going to show up to class. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, to me, there's going to be something bigger or something going on that's going to be that you'll have to dig deeper and find what's beneath the surface in those type of students. Um, you know, what, what I don't do is what we find out too, is that you don't want to throw so many things at them that, you know, you become like emails that you get, that you, you see come in your inbox. You're like, Oh, it's another ad delete. And so you want to make sure when you're contacting students, it is important. It is an important announcement. It is an important welcome. It's, you know, these are important things to do. And if they don't do it, there's some kind of consequence of not opening those up. And so when people share uh, like a, an announcement, usually it's about a test. It's usually about a key strategy to finish an activity or to tip on a test or something. And so they become very valuable informations, not saying that that's going to be the key ingredient to have students be more active in sharing these informations, but uh, it does help up. And then I have someone also, Kylie, thank you for sharing this one. It says markup is one we've been using since going remote. So markup, M-A-R-K-U-P. So search for markup. I'm definitely using it. I don't think I've used markup. So I'm going to try. I'm looking up markup. Thanks, Kylie. I appreciate that. There's just so many cool things out there. It's just hard to get them all on there. Thank you so much. And it allows to turn your website into a dynamic canvas ready for feedback and collaboration. It streamlines your feedback with a quicker and easier and clearer process is markup. So thank you so much So share markups. If you're thinking of one, uh, in addition to those tools that we mentioned before, uh, add markup to the list. So Google markup. And that markup is one word, M-A-R-K-U-P. Thank you, Kylie. I appreciate it. All right. Let's hit this last one here. And that's independent instruction. This one is, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, independent instruction is, I think, just as important you know, as offering teamwork and group work for students. Because each individual should be, you know, having the time in your class or in your lab to work indep independently. And yeah, we're here to give some guidance, but, you know, we can offer choices for students or say, you know, you can pick these type of three topics to do a research project on or whatever it might be. Uh, but you also want to give the students enough space where they have to manage their study. And so what happens is, is that they're going to build, you know, the skills that they need in whatever project they're getting but they're also gonna build these soft skills along with the independent instruction. So they're gonna to have to, you know, they have to implement organizational soft skills that they uh, probably need to work on. They need to work on time management soft skills type things and planning skills as well. And all this is gonna go hand in hand with the project. So independent instruction is really nice. And it's one of those things, you know, as a teacher, I, I went back, I think about like how much time actually does my student work by him or herself? You know, usually we, we work in groups and they all could always, you know, bounce ideas off each other. They can look for help, which is, which is fantastic. But at the same time, I feel like that's a way for some students to kind of slip by, uh, you know, and get through the cracks where I don't pick them up as they're really struggling because I can always ask, you know, I can always ask Kylie for help because she has my back and she knows that her stuff. And then I'm kind of struggling along and I just get by and I don't want that to happen. I want to make sure I give enough opportunity as a teacher for my students to learn independently so they can really showcase their strengths or they realize that they are maybe deficient in the area and they can reach out for help uh, to you. So that's the importance of uh, independent instruction. And hopefully you can reflect back on that and say, you know, do I actually give independent instruction enough 
or how much do I give? Do I give any at all? And start thinking about that as we think about, you know, how to implement good independent instruction, whether it's a structured one. Again, I, I, I put the training wheels on back on a little bit and I, I go back a little bit and say, OK, the, this is what you need to do. And I check in on awful lots or it's more self-guided. I say, here's the project. Uh, I'll see you in three weeks when you have to present. And so, you know, depending on where, where you feel is most comfortable and maybe it depends on what level of class you have whether it's the beginning of your course time, what's week one versus week eight, that can be a difference between structured and self-guided types of, uh, of independence. Some tools, you might use these already, but I do want to mention them. One is the writing journal or learning logs. And I think these are nice because these, again, help students think about what they know or don't know. Uh, typically, uh, uh, when I uh, talk about these, I have teachers that tell me they give the last 10 minutes of class, last five minutes of class, where students have to write a summary or write, you know, what their muddiest point was, what their most confusing point was, what they really liked about it. Just some type of journal writing, some type of learning long. So they're learning about their learning. They're getting that they're getting it or they're getting that they're not getting it, for example. And they're doing this every single day or doing this every other day or whenever they're in a lab, for example, and keeping this, this journal, this writing log, because it's going to be very important to get that that log where they either keep it themselves and it helps them or it's a log that they share with you. And so now you get all these like uh, uh, logs that they either send to you online or they write it in their, they have a journal, you know, like a notebook, you get those. And then you can kind of see where the muddy points were, where people were confused at, and you can work that until tomorrow, to tomorrow's lessons. So where logs is really cool research paper. I mentioned here, uh, just to note, I had some uh, individuals like, oh, I'll do research paper. They do that in English class. Well, yes. But again, we if you want to stress writing skills as a, as a soft skill, you might want to think of ways to implement research projects. And these are done, you know, if you are in a, a core course, it can be researching famous people in uh, who are in that field. It can be researching brands or companies or debatable topics and all that can lend itself to a great research project that that's not you know a general you know research project but it's it, it's helpful and it makes sense in the course that you are in so just don't don't discount research projects maybe something real nice and it, again it's some of that independent instruction that they can be working on and that you can check in or not check in over the course of a couple of days or a couple of weeks even and so that's a nice way to implement it the last thing i want to mention for independent instruction is career practice as again, it, it goes back to, you know, how much are the students in your lab or in your classroom uh, working on procedures, uh, working on troubleshooting things, working on fixing things? Uh, are they doing it by themselves? Are they with other individuals? And just making sure you feel comfortable where, you know, where that line at is for you, where Okay, yep, it's great that they work in groups, but yes, they need maybe more time or maybe they need less time uh, to do some career practice by themselves. And so just take that into account. So those are types of um, uh, independent instruction. Just want to mention those on there. I'm sure there are tons of other things that are kind of similar to those learning longs. And again, it's just going to depend on what type of uh, teacher you are. If you have that five minutes at the very end, whether you like looking at uh, a summary of the class, or you like looking at the muddiest point of the class and getting that information, and that can be uh, maybe a key for you to implement into tomorrow's lesson. It it all depends on again what you like as you prefer. Maybe you try the muddiest point first, and then you move to uh, a summary. Can a student summarize things in a in one minute or in five minutes or so on? So hopefully that one is okay for uh, types of instruction. And if you have any more, throw them in the, in the thing. We'll we'll conclude here after. We just mentioned assessments because I do want to note for assessments that, you know, there's there's two main kinds. And when you think of ones that you can do all the way through from direct to indirect, uh, you know, where you're doing interactive or even independent, you can do these formative type assessments. And formative is lower stakes. And it's all about monitoring, monitoring learning. And so these aren't like the high end, like if you look on summative, this is about evaluating learning where you, you think about like a midterm exam or a final, final project. Those are summative. Think about ways you can implement formative types of assessments into your daily practice. You know, whether it's uh, during a lecture, it's during an activity, it's during a demonstration. You know, what can you do? One was shared with me, and I, I love this one because I used a poll everywhere before. And then... Um, 
what you can do is you can uh, go in and you can use Ploy Rewards, which is great. Someone mentioned Kahoot, which I which looks beautiful, by the way. So I like Kahoot as a way to hold the audience. Uh, some schools use Google Slides, and Google Slides has a Q&A option, kind of like what we have right here, but it's built in, and Google Slides is free. So like the Google Slides one someone mentioned, so thank you for sharing Google Slides. You could also do these... Uh, Exit tickets we talked about, and that's kind of like those those like little papers that we write, those little things where their students have to come into class and they have to take a short, you know, again, low stakes, five question quiz that covers the main topics. And, you know, you do that at the very beginning of class or they have to write an exit ticket. Before they leave class, they have to go in and they have to, um, you know, uh, write a summary on what you did today and, and, you know, make sure, and they have to hand them to you so you can see if people are getting or not getting it. Those are kind of exit or uh, enter or admit or exit tickets. And that kind of goes along with that one minute paper. Can you summarize everything we did today in one minute? It's almost like, can, can you tweet this out? Basically I had someone do, instead of one minute paper, can you write this in 180 characters or less of what today was all about? And they, they would, I'd actually photocopied uh, like a blank Twitter box, which I thought was, was, was pretty, pretty interesting. I like that idea just to make it, make the kind of quote unquote boring old one minute papers a little bit more of its times, which I thought was really neat. And I keep mentioning the muddiest point. That's just a great way. I think I like doing the muddiest point because I'm just saying, what's muddy. What was muddy for you? Maybe you kind of understood it. It's not like, what did you not know? Cause some people don't want to share, like they didn't know something. So I call it the muddiest point. So what's the muddiest point uh, in your assessments? And if you could do that all the way through, make it low stakes, some uh, individuals don't even offer it for a grade, then you can get that type of lesson. You can get that kind of feel, that temperature for the course in these formative type of assessments. How can you gauge student learning and take the temperature of your class all the way through from start to finish? That's formative. You're monitoring learning. Are they getting it? Or are they not getting it? When you get to summative assessment, you're going to evaluate it. This is the high stakes midterm exam, the big test, you know, the final project. And these happen at the end. So when you look at formative, it's during, summative at the end. And so, again, I, I challenge you to reflect on that and say, how often am I doing this formative type of assessment? So what can I do? Can I offer these, these exit tickets at the end of the day that they have to write or, you know, submit something in an email, or if you use an LMS, they have to submit something as a text submission, or can I do these polls, you know, online? And if you don't have polling software and you're not a tech person, do the low stakes one is a, what someone mentioned earlier, chunk it down and chunk it down to only just, you know, talk for 15 minutes, pause, and then uh, look for questions and ask questions and, you know, and take a little break there. So that's your little informal, low, no tech poll. Uh, that you can do uh, just by uh, stopping and, and chunking down your lecture a little bit. But if you do like tech stuff, you can definitely do the polls and whatnot and do that during the assessments. With that said, I do want to leave some time here at the very end before we hit the half hour to get some time uh, to uh, share some good ideas. So as you go through, look at all the different types of instructions that you can do. And again, this doesn't have to be equal. Right now on my screen, they're all pretty much equal. Um, but maybe direct instruction is, is conducive to this type of lesson. That's going to be a lot more. Maybe you don't need independent instruction. Maybe you like interactive for this project, and that one's going to balloon up a little bit. And that's okay. Uh, you can do these in different orders if you want. This is just the template that I just like to provide that says, you know what, if I don't know where to start, I want to try it. This is a way that kind of, again, if you think about putting the spotlight on you, getting the information out there, and then you're, again, you're, you're holding the bike for the student with the, with the training wheels. And then pretty soon, you're not holding the bike, and they are on the training wheels. Then you take the training wheels off. That's the interactive. You're either going to be low impact, passive at the beginning, so more engaged, more active, more engaged, more active, and so on, as they're going to be fully, hopefully, engaged and active. And depending on what you're presenting, it might be best to do direct. It might be best to do indirect or independent or interactive. Uh, so I want to say thank you so much. I want to share my email. I know some people were asking about my email. I want to share... Uh, my david.grimes at cyana.com. And you can email me anytime you want, uh, you know, tonight or, you know, three months from now, if you have a question. And I, I just want to say, I, I appreciate your time spending with me. I, I know I have a couple people. If you are a full, a four webinar person, definitely give me a heads up in there, a hello in the, in the, in the question and answer. I appreciate you joining me for all four, or maybe this one, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of your group, your ACCSC member group. 
And, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a, have really great, I call them, you're, you're basically like a family where I had my staff there at the bottom. If you look in the screen, that's my staff some, oh, seven years ago, probably. I think kind of, I'm losing track of time. I'm losing track of days too, with uh, being at home for so many days in a row, but I think it's about seven years. I had a fantastic group of staff. They were a great family. I have my family students who I still in contact with a lot of times and seeing them, uh, a flourish in the career is awesome. I, you know, uh, seeing graduation is pretty cool, but then seeing them um, moving up in in their field is even better. My my team here at Siena and then uh, the team at ACCSC. Hopefully, we can see each other soon at, at a conference or uh, passing by. If I could stop by your school, that would be fantastic. So I want to say thank you so much. I appreciate your time with me today, and I'll try to get some uh, questions and answers uh, out here for you. Um, and I'll just, uh, with that, I want to say thank you for joining me and definitely take a look at the handout section uh, at the very end there. And you can grab, you can grab that certificate and then you can um, definitely check the ACCSC website for any updates that you need uh, to uh, check out. You know, if you need a, a certificate, the recording, my slideshow, that's all going to be up there. And then also make note on April 16th, if you go to the ACCSC.org website, they have a COVID-19 question and answer where they're going to review some of the challenges that uh, uh, member schools are facing and then offer some guidance and tips and tricks and stuff too. So definitely join that one. It's April 16th. It's at 1130 Eastern. Uh, that's the COVID-19 question and answer webinar that's going to be given by ACCSC. So I'm definitely going to be on the opposite side. I'm going to join that one and, and check out some of the good uh, tips and tricks that the team at ACCSC is offering. With that, uh, thank you so much. This officially ends the presentation. And again, thank you so much. And I appreciate your time with me uh, over today, over the last maybe four webinars, if you've joined me from the start. I really appreciate your time. Good luck with everything. If you need anything, david.grimes at cyanid.com. Thank you so much. All right. So let me see here. I got a couple questions on there. I had, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I, let's see. Is, let's see who got uh, Ginger. If Ginger, you're still on there near North Canton. I actually grew up in North Canton, Ohio. So I'm, I'm a North Canton Hoover Viking. Uh, so I, I, I'm a fan of orange and black. So if, uh, if Ginger's still on there, thank you so much. I am in that area. I don't know if you're in that area as well. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, Ashley, all four, Monica, all four, Angelica, four, uh, Holly, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining all four. It's awesome. You got to spend so much time with me. Uh, of course, uh, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Z too. I've been talking to him a lot. That's been awesome. And some other tips too, uh, they have, uh, Ryan says they use Microsoft Teams. I did. I was on a, a call with someone who used Microsoft. I never used it before. And it was actually really nice. I liked it. Uh, they offer this video chat and you can do some extra things that Ryan said, like uh, some of the polls and stuff too. So thank you, Ryan, for that one. Microsoft Teams. I, I definitely have that one installed now on my smartphone. Even though I'm a Mac guy, the Microsoft Teams worked, worked very well. I had a group that used Teams, so I was able to sign on and use it uh, pretty well. So thank you very much. Uh, Martha, thank you. Uh, get a proud of this. I took notes, but don't want to miss anything. Karen, yes, uh, this will be available. And I'll say soon. I think they're going to wait till uh, this one's completed. Uh, you can get a printout of uh, my slides. I save them as a PDF file. And that way, I, I use Keynote, uh, but you can uh, grab these as a PDF file. That way, if you're a Mac or PC person, or it doesn't matter if you have Keynote or not, uh, you can access my uh, my files anytime. And then uh, the team at ACCSC, uh, they, they render these recordings, save them, and they uh, put them out as a link for you on the accsc.org website. And it is under uh, the webinar section. So if you go to events and do webinar, I'm going to do it right now, events and webinar, you can see that well. So let me, uh, I'll bring that up for anybody who wants to check that out. So let me uh, close out of my presentation for a second and I'll bring up the uh, website here. Let me quit my presentation and bring up, there we go. So this is the uh, COVID-19 resources page on there. Uh, this is where you can visit the April 16th webinar, the 19th. I can register today. And if, again, if you go to accsc.org, the webinar stuff that's going to be available, my slides, the recording stuff is under events and then webinars right here. So you'll see that page there. And if you just scroll down a little bit more, you get the COVID-19 resources, which is great. And so, again, just I always like the bookmark. ACCSC does a fantastic job with all this information. I love it. I love just going to a page and finding exactly what I need. So COVID-19 resources, read more, and you can uh, register for that webinar. Definitely join that webinar. I think that one's going to be a really, really nice one, uh, just like the other one was. So definitely go to that website. And then when you go up to the events and webinar, you're going to be able to grab these uh, resources here pretty soon. Um, I know they're trying to get everything up and running. So uh, and I have to share this presentation with them, too, in my slides. So it might take a, a couple days. Uh, but it will be up there. Thank you so much.
Monica, thank you. Kate, thank you. All right. <laughs> Black and gold, <laughs> Sherry. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Microsoft Teams. I have another person using my, uh, Microsoft Teams, so definitely check uh, Microsoft Teams. Oh, I like that one, Jessica. Uh, Facebook Workplace is awesome as well. Thank you for mentioning that. I forgot to mention Facebook. If uh, And again, people are going to be uh, – a lot of our students use Facebook, at least uh, at least in my experience. So creating a Facebook group and, and sharing items on there was real nice or doing the Facebook Workplace for your own uh, for your own organization, your own school is a nice way to do it. So if you have a good um, – helping of individuals that use Facebook. This doesn't, it was really, um, they're already used to the interface, so you can use Facebook Workplace. So Jessica, thank you for Facebook uh, Workplace. That's a fantastic one. Thank you, Stephanie, all four. I appreciate it. A lot of all four, that's awesome. I appreciate it. That's, that's a lot of webinars here. We had two last week, uh, one two weeks ago, and one this week, and then uh, got some more coming up uh, with other people. So I appreciate it. Let's see. Yeah, Holly, that's a good one. Holly was talking about dealing with students who are, uh, you know, we're talking about, we mentioned difficult students a little bit, and we're talking about just like hostile students. Uh, one is making sure that, uh, I always just like to review those plans with everybody. It's one of those things that like, you know, uh, you, you probably have um, uh, the smoke alarm, the fire alarm at your house, but do, you know, do you have a plan? Uh, does your kid know that, that there's a plan for that? Uh, same thing with uh, with our staff and faculty and new is just going over what your procedures are that dealing with those is, is always the first step. You know, how to deal with a hostile situation, who's your go-to, who's the backup, who you call, all that stuff is going to be very important. Uh, two is, I would say, it, it's, it's tough because it's going to be so individualized on the person and what that, what their experience is and why they're abusive and all that stuff. But I can just say that I, I've seen success in ones that don't get away with it. Uh, we mentioned this before. If, if a student is misbehaving, whether it's abusive or it's just being being a smart smart aleck in class, if they can get away with it and students see they get away with it, you not only lose the respect for that one individual who's being a smart aleck or the one person who's being abusive and in, 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 in like a language you're using, but you lose all everybody else because they know that you don't have control of the classroom. So the one thing is to make sure there are consequences. So if there is the chip on their shoulder, they are being uh, disrespectful or some way, it has to be dealt with. And it has to be dealt with in a way that that is, you know, they're not in class the next time or or something even worse. Um, I wish I had a, a magic solution because I've, I've been in those situations before and they're not fun at all. Uh, but it just, we just followed our procedures that we had and we reiter reiterated those procedures to all the uh, teachers and staff members and stuff and made sure that, you know, there are these backup people that are involved. So if something happened in my class, you know, I know exactly what to do and, and what's the best course of action to take and who can be there to assist me and how do I get that, that help. That's usually the most important thing. Uh, other than that, you know, it's tough to say what you can do to deal with a, a hostile student that's going to be universal. But I would definitely say, you know, copy all communication with that student to a man. Definitely. Yes. Uh, Ginger, thank you so much. Yeah, that's all about that, that note taking and, and, and communication. If you have an online system that, that records like uh, the notes and stuff like that, that's perfect. Um, I, and I've been in places where it's, it's, it's great to share that information. Uh, some teachers don't want that preconceived, uh, you know, not, not a stereotype, but they don't want the, all the negative stuff coming in. They want to, they want that student to de demonstrate good or bad in their class and see how it goes. Uh, so, uh, you know, for me, I, I prefer information just, I'm, I'm, I've been on the men side too. So I just like more information to know about the students and document every occurrence. So it's not a surprise. This goes back to our aid cart, our aid crate situation too. Whereas if that student was terrible in my class, I want to make sure everybody knows because I don't want that person going to the next class and, and surprising that next teacher. And that's just that's just me being uh, that's my personal thing about it. Uh, but it'll be uh, uh, you know up to you and your administrators basically to, to develop some type of plan of action. I would say the best course is to make sure everybody's safe more than anything else. And I, I'm like, you. Yeah, I'd love to help everybody, but sometimes it's going to be difficult to help someone who doesn't want to be helped, uh, especially if you've done everything that you can in your power to help that person. Sometimes, you know, it just, there's that unfortunate reality that uh, that person's not going to be able to, you know, be in the court, in your class at that time, at least. Thank you so much. 
Oh, Paul, uh, Monica, uh, Paltoons, uh, P-O-W-T-O-O-N-S, Paltoons. See if I can type that in correctly real quick here. Uh, Paltoons, you get these uh, kind of templates, which is great that you can go in. Uh, not affiliated with them at all. I've just been using them for a long time. Uh, but you can go and use templates and then you can create your own little like, have you seen those hand videos that the hand comes up and they draw things? Uh, you can do that type of things or you can have text appear or like for, for me, I had a virtual my, me in it. There actually looked like there was a character that was a free template that looked like me. It had like the dark hair, um, uh, pretty uh, uh, ner nerdy looking guy. So I, I picked that guy uh, to represent me. But there's templates for all kinds of cool stuff and you can make these and share them with students. So it, there is a little learning curve. Uh, but if you uh, spend, you know, if you make if you make one video and, and practice, you, you'll probably get the hang of it pretty quickly. Uh, if you have uh, experience making videos, this would be a, a breeze for you. Uh, it just depends on, on your thing. So you can see uh, different types of templates and stuff on here. But definitely give it a whirl. It's free, so it doesn't hurt. So if you have some time, you can go through uh, employee onboarding, which you can turn to maybe, you know, student onboarding. Um, they have these explainer videos that you can have. Again, these are all templates that you can just uh, edit the text and maybe add your logo or add some of your own pictures into it, and you can uh, get some uh, cool videos that way. And again, just a different way to present information. Sometimes I've used this in different lectures and stuff too. If I'm presenting a topic and instead of a PowerPoint screen or, or my head talking, I'll cut to some type of Paltoon video. So that's Paltoons. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. I think I'm getting low on the questions here, but uh, again, I'll, I'm going to end the presentation here. We're about we're about 36 after, so I want to make sure I give you enough time to wrap up any loose ends that you can. If you're on the East Coast near the end of the day here, so I want to make sure you can uh, wrap up your day accordingly. Uh, thank you so so much. I, I am eternally grateful. And again, I really hope to bump into you sometime in the near future, maybe at the conference or somewhere. Uh, tell me that uh, you enjoy my my webinar. I'll be so happy to to see you in person. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can share some great stories. So with that, I want to say thank you very, very much, uh, and good luck with everything. If you need anything, again, david.grimes at sina.com. Thank you so much.